Good morning. We welcome you to our service here at Trinity. Today is the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. Epiphany means manifestation, making known. And today we see how Jesus makes himself known as the Christ, the Messiah, by fulfilling a prophecy of Isaiah. It is called Worker Appreciation Day. Called workers have that joy and privilege of sharing the message of the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. Each of us as believers have the joy and privilege of both hearing that message and then also sharing that message with others so that they might know the same joy that you and I experience in Christ our Messiah. This morning we follow a special order of service as found in your worship folder. It will also be uh, presented on the wall behind me. We begin our service then with our first hymn as printed in the bulletin and on the wall. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless our worship today. Lord God, our Father, 
We thank you for giving us teachers and pastors to share your word with us and our children and to encourage us in our relationship with you. Please bless all those who serve in your public ministry and fill them with your Holy Spirit so that they may be a true blessing to us in the best possible way. Help us so that we also may be a blessing to those who have been called to serve us. Please bless our worship this morning. Please bless the pastor as he leads us in worship and proclaims your word to us. Strengthen us through your word and accept our prayers and praises. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us approach the Lord in humility, confess our sins to him, and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Having heard your confession, I share with you the blessing of God's mercy through Jesus. On the basis of Jesus' perfect life for you and his innocent death on the cross, I declare to you that all your sins are forgiven. Take heart. Through faith in Jesus, you are God's dear child. And the blessings of his salvation are yours personally, to enjoy forever. He will always guide you and help you. When the time is right, the Lord will take you to be with him in glory everlasting. I announce this to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We praise you, Lord, for your grace and mercy.
Please be seated. We join together in reading responsively selected readings on the qualifications and directives for workers in God's kingdom. If you're following in your worship folder, this is in the middle of page six. Here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife. Not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught. Dear Father in heaven, grant this to our called workers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. Flee the evil desires of youth. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct. Whatever happens, set an example for the believers. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Dear Father in heaven, grant this to our called workers. The children's choir will sing, With the Lord begin your task. Jesus. 
We join together in reading selected scripture readings on how we are to regard and treat workers in God's kingdom. This is on page 8. Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Anyone who receives instruction in the word, in the same way the Lord has commanded, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. So then, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Please also give your attention to the inspired words of the Apostle Paul as found recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We begin reading at verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, Death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Here ends our epistle lesson, the word of God. We join together in singing hymn 85, O God, from God.
please rise. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from the one true and triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we give our attention to the word as found in Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. At this time we'll hear verses 17 to 21. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So far, God's word. Please be seated. Dear fellow, redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, the teams are set. After last week's championship playoffs, we now know who will appear in the Super Bowl. Leading up to those championship games, there were any number of prophecies and predictions as to who would win those games. We know that in the Super Bowl, the Carolina Panthers will face off against the Denver Broncos. Since those two teams have won, once again, there are all sorts of prophecies, predictions being made as to who will come out on top in Super Bowl number 50. We'll know later on next Sunday. As you look in the pages of Old Testament scriptures, there are all sorts of prophecies and predictions about the coming Messiah, the coming Christ. It was a prophecy, a prediction first made already in the Garden of Eden. A prophecy made by God himself. After Adam and Eve's fall into sin. It was a prophecy that was repeated for thousands of years. And this morning, as we look at these words of Luke, we see how Jesus, fulfilled a prophecy of Isaiah by his coming and by his message. The text before us records Jesus' second appearance up north in that region of Galilee. You might remember what happened there the first time he was in Galilee. You heard about it, I believe, a couple weeks ago. He changed the water into wine at that wedding banquet thereby helping out that bridal couple. But more than that, by performing that miracle, he showed himself, he manifested himself, he made himself known, not just as true man, but also as true God. Since that time, he had traveled south to Judea and the city of Jerusalem. He had driven out the traders and money changers from the temple. He had per performed numerous miracles in the city. He had gathered around himself a number of disciples. He had instructed that Jewish council member who came to him at night, Nicodemus, as recorded in John chapter 3. On his return back north, to Galilee, he stopped off in Samaria by the well and gave to the woman he met there the living water of the gospel. No doubt the people in Galilee heard of these activities, these works of Jesus, one they no doubt considered to be a hometown boy. 
We read in verses 14 and 15 that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. It was God's will that Jesus go back to northern Palestine. For we're told that he returned in the power of the Spirit. We remember that at his baptism, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit for the work of preaching the gospel and delivering the message of the living God to a world lost in sin. There in Galilee, many people heard Jesus teach and preach. They saw his miracles. He became so famous that wherever he went, people knew who Jesus was. It seems that most often, Jesus began his work in different parts of Galilee by going to the synagogue, the church. It was the center of Jewish worship. Not only gathered there on the Sabbath, But there were things that went on during the week. Education of the young, as the young learn God's Ten Commandments, the history of God's people, Israel. And while he was up north there in Galilee once again, he did not forget his hometown, the town he had grown up in. Just think about it. It was in that city of Nazareth that Jesus spent most of his life, most of the time, Jesus spent here on this earth, was spent there in the city of Nazareth. It was there that he had learned how to be a carpenter from his father, Joseph. It was there that he used that trade after his father had passed away. And by using that trade, no doubt, helped take care of his mother and his brothers. We're told that he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. When the Sabbath came, Jesus went to the synagogue, as was his custom. Just think about those words for a second. They tell us that Jesus was regular in worship attendance even though he's the very Son of God, knew more about the Word than any human being, yet he took time, made time in his schedule to go to church, to be regular in the synagogue, in worship. And we might wonder why. What we can say and what we know is that Jesus came, he fulfilled all righteousness, Jesus kept God's law perfectly in every way. Yes, he who had complete knowledge set us the perfect example by being regular in worship, hearing, studying God's word. Were Jesus here today, he obviously would encourage us to follow his example, to be regular in our worship, that we might grow and show our faith. Jesus would encourage us to take to heart, recite, remember those words of the psalmist, Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. He would have us remember the encouragement of Hebrews 10.25. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another. And all the more, as you see the day, Judgment Day, approaching. And from the Apostle Paul in Romans 10, 17, we are reminded why regular worship, why being in God's Word is important. Paul writes by inspiration, Faith 
comes from hearing the message, and of course, so does the strengthening of our faith. And the message is heard to the word of Christ. The services there in the Jewish synagogue, very similar to the ones we conduct today. Psalms of thanksgiving were sung. Prayers were spoken. A selection from the Pentateuch, the first five books, was read as well as a selection from one of the prophets. That selection was then explained, expounded upon. And the service was closed with a benediction or a blessing. Now whether Jesus was asked to lead as he came into the synagogue, whether he indicated his desire to do so, whether people just expected him to do it, we're not really told. What we are told is this, verse 17 to 19. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What Jesus reads is the first verse and a half of Isaiah chapter 61, omitting that phrase, day of vengeance, because that would not happen until his second coming. I remember that this prophecy of Isaiah found partial fulfillment with the return of the remnant from the Babylonian captivity. When they came back to the city of Jerusalem and Judea, rebuilt that city, rebuilt the temple, that was the partial fulfillment. Complete fulfillment, however, was found in the coming of the Christ, the Messiah. His incarnation taking on of human flesh, his humiliation and his exaltation. Yes, Jesus is the one who is referred to here in Isaiah's prophecy. We remember how Jesus was anointed at his baptism by the Holy Spirit who descended on him in the form of a dove. God the Father spoke his approval of the work his son would do. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. At his baptism, Jesus was designated for that task of Messiah, the Christ, the Deliverer. He was anointed as prophet to preach good news to the poor. The poor here are not those who are lacking in this world's goods. Jesus' mission is not to tell those who are poor in the things of this world that Things will get better. I'll make you richer. No, the poor here are those who are poor before God. They have no righteousness with which to stand before God. All they deserve from God is to be cast away from His sight. Punishment, damnation. The good news that Jesus has come to preach to poor sinners like me and you is that because of His sacrifice, we have a right standing with God above. Because of his sacrifice, we have the forgiveness of sins. Our text continues, He, the Holy Spirit, has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind. Have you ever pictured yourself as a captive? That's what a sinner is. Sin's like a harsh taskmaster who treats the sinner as a slave forces him to do things he would not, should not do. Here again, we might think of the children of Israel, how they were held captive by the Babylonians, no doubt many of them even being bound, shackled in chains. Think of the joy they felt when they heard that those chains would be removed, they would be set free. Oh, well, my friends, that's the same joy that is ours as we remember how the Messiah has come and has, how he has broken those shackles off of us by his sacrifice on the cross. He has set us free from bondage to sin, death, hell, the devil. 
The sinner is described also as blind. Sin blinds the mind's eyes. So we don't know the difference between right and wrong, good and evil. Many times the sinner does something that's wrong, they don't think is wrong at all. We're spiritually blind by nature. The task of the Messiah is to tell the blind that there is recovery of sight. My fellow believers, through Jesus, we have that recovery of sight. He has performed an eye operation on us. He has removed the scales. Our eyes, our spiritual eyes are open so that we see clearly that sinners though we are, punishment though we deserve for that sin, yet because of the Messiah, we have the forgiveness of our sins. We have a right relationship with God above. He has sent me to release the oppressed. Again, a picture of captivity, this time of a prison cell. And you can picture those Israelites, many of them sitting in prison cells, being beaten bloody by the jailers. That's what sin does. Destroys the body little by little, causes a great deal of pain and suffering. If any of you enjoy watching old Western movies, you can relate to prison breaks. How they back a horse up, tie a rope around the bars, and have that horse pull with all its might so the prisoners could be set free. That's what Jesus has done for us. He has broken the prison bars out. He has broken down the prison doors so that we are no longer in bondage. He has set us free from the consequences of our sin. And Jesus says, He has sent me to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Here's a reference to the Old Testament year of Jubilee. According to Jewish ceremonial law, every 50th year was a year of Jubilee. And in that year, all the slaves were set free, all debts canceled, forgiven, and all land and property returned to its original owner. And of course, there was great joy throughout the land. The year of the Lord's favor. The Lord's favor leads us to think how because of Jesus, the debt we owe has been stamped, paid in full. You now are reconciled to God. You have a right relationship with Him. Because what I, the Messiah, had done for you. And then He rolled up the scroll. He gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Jewish rabbis generally sat as they taught. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on Him. They were eager to see how Jesus would explain the portion of Isaiah He had just read. Perhaps there were some even watching closely, hoping to catch him in his words and trap him. Does he begin by reminding his audience of the golden years of Israel now long gone? Does he begin by reminding and telling his listeners that, you know, those golden years, they're coming back. You're going to be a great and powerful nation once again. He doesn't, does he? We're told. And he said to them, today, today, Right here and now, is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing? My friends, just think. Just think how his listeners must have been stunned. Here is one who is a hometown boy. One they watched grow up. One they watched work as a carpenter. And he is saying, this scripture is fulfilled in me. I am that long-awaited and long-promised Messiah. I am the Christ. Here is one of Jesus' clearest statements to the fact that He is the Messiah, the Savior. 
what joy fills us. As we see how Jesus fulfilled this prophecy of Isaiah by his coming, by his message, what joy fills us as we recognize again what that means for us. God kept his promise. God sent his son to be our savior. Today, you observe called Worker Sunday. As called workers, it is a joy and privilege that we have to share how God kept that promise, how he sent his son, the Messiah, to preach good news to poor sinners, to give recovery of sight to those who are blind and cannot see, to release those who were held captive in the bondage of sin, death, hell, the devil. How they have favor with God. How we have favor with God. A right relationship because of Jesus. Yes, it is the joy and privilege of called workers to share that wonderful news with you. Well, my friends, as fellow believers, it is the joy of privilege each and every one of us have to not only hear that message, but then to go and tell others why we are filled with such joy, such hope, and such confidence. It's not based on us, not based on anything in this world, but it's based on God alone, the God who has loved us. The God who kept his promise. The God who sent his son. The Christ, the Messiah. Who fulfilled not only that prophecy of Isaiah, but every prophecy. The one who died that we might live. That we might have true and lasting freedom. We thank God for his kept promises. We thank God for that message. We thank God for our called workers. We thank God for you, our fellow believers. God continue to keep us in his message, in his will, in his way, now and always. Amen. You may remain seated. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue our service with the gathering of our thank offerings. As we gather our thank offerings, we will sing in Christ alone.
Please rise for prayer. We join together in the response of prayer as it begins on page 12 if you're following in your worship folder. Dear Lord Jesus, in your wisdom you have established the office of the holy ministry in order to bring honor to the triune God and to serve and bless souls in this world. Lord, we know that servants in your ministry are sinful human beings who need your forgiveness, your love, and help. When we look at them and consider their position and service among us, help us to focus especially on you. Help us to remember that you have called them to serve us and that they are your representatives. Help us to give them honor and respect for your sake. O oh, Savior, we know that apart from you, none of us can serve and be a blessing in your kingdom. This is especially true of those who serve in the public ministry. Lead us to pray for them and ask you to give them the gifts, the dedication, the humility, the courage, and the stamina needed to be a true blessing in your ministry. Above all, Lord, keep them faithful to you and to all of your word. Don't let them fall away. Don't let them fall into sin or false doctrine. Give to each one of them a servant's heart. Give them the spiritual gifts needed to do the work you have called them to do. Fill them with your love and enable them to show your love to others. Grant them a rich measure of your Holy Spirit so that in all things, in all ways, at all times, they may serve in a way that truly honors you and brings blessings to others. Lord, continue to grant your blessing to Trinity Lutheran Church and School. Please bless our members, our teachers, and our pastor, so that our congregation and school may honor you in all things and truly be a blessing in this world. Lord, you have been so good to our congregation and school. You have blessed us so richly. Please continue to grant your wonderful blessings to us. This past year, Lord, you have brought new souls to our congregation and school. Thank you, Lord for the privilege of sharing with them the good news of your love and your salvation. O 
O Lord God, you are the Lord of life and death. In your mercy you called from this world to yourself in heaven the soul of Cheryl Raywert's mother. We thank you for having brought her to the knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask that you would comfort the family and all who mourn her death with your precious promises and cheer them with a sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless body rest and at last together with us all a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach each of us to number our days that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved. And hear us, Lord, as we also bring you our private petition. Hear us, O Lord, and look upon us in your grace. We bring our requests to you, not because of any good in us, but only on account of your great mercy. We know that you will hear us as we pray because of Jesus, our Savior. In his name, we also join in praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for granting us your blessings this day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to do what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. The Lord Almighty is with us. God of Jacob is our fortress. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. 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 Congregation may be seated. The men's choir will sing peace. Go now in peace. Following that, we'll sing, not unto us, please note, we'll sing verses 1 and 4 of that closing hymn. 1 and 4. Yeah. 
Once again, good morning. Good to see all of you in our service today. If there are visitors, we would invite you to sign the guest book, which is found just beyond the double doors. If you're looking for information, more information about Trinity Church and School, please be sure to grab a, a visitor's packet or ask somebody, and I'm sure they will give you more information or direct you to the appropriate person. I would certainly like to uh, thank you for the opportunity and thank Pastor Raywitz for the opportunity to be here this morning to share God's word with you. Um, as noted, uh, Pastor Cheryl and family hope to be arriving back home sometime today. I believe the funeral for uh, Cheryl's mother was held on Friday. Uh, as mentioned in the prayer, we certainly uh, pray to God that he would come, continue to comfort and strengthen them at this time of loss. I'd like to thank uh, the children's choir as long as, as well as, excuse me, the men's choir uh, for singing this morning. Um, note that after the service uh, is the quarterly voters meeting, so all voters, please be sure to stay around. Um, also, um, there's a special fellowship meal um, as it is called Worker Appreciation Day, so you're invited to uh, that potluck meal. The potluck meal will begin um, after the voters' meeting and after Sunday school. I believe you can read the rest of the information in the service folder as you have the opportunity, um, and that will give you what you need to know. Um, at this time, uh, please give your attention to the Wells Connection.
I'm Wells President Mark Schrader and welcome to your January Wells Connection. With 2016 now underway, let's take one last look at the blessings of the previous year with an eye toward our future. Home Missions approved seven new starts in 2015, ranging from new churches in suburban areas to cross-cultural ministries in urban settings. And we continue our program that allows our seminary students to experience home mission work in their vicar year. I just want to learn as much as I can so that after I'm done, when I'm out there and I'm a pastor, I can be the most effective one as possible. In 2015, World Missions celebrated the 10th anniversary of Asia Lutheran Seminary in Hong Kong, a city that's a gateway to one billion Chinese. And the lessons we learned in various places overseas continue to benefit our outreach efforts back home, as people from all over the world make America their new home. The Great Commission is to proclaim the gospel to all groups of people, for every family and everyone. Luther Preparatory School celebrated 150 years of service in 2015. And our ministerial education system continued to develop improved ways to reach new communities, including an urban ministry program at Martin Luther College. Go ahead, Marquise. Anything that steps us outside of our comfort zone is frightening and it's scary, um, but it's the only way to reach the people that need to be reached. One group that always needs our special attention is our youth. Kids Connection! One of our longest running tools for youth, the monthly Kids Connection videos marked 20 years of service in 2015. Stay connected! Stay connected to Jesus! As technology becomes an increasingly useful tool for ministry, we expanded our interactive faith online Bible studies this past year. I have gone back to the archive sections and, and watched them almost like a, a binge-watching approach. Another major effort started in 2015 is our Synod's debt elimination offering called One in Christ. Eliminating the remaining $4.7 million debt will help us to continue the ministry that God has so richly blessed for us, freeing up resources to meet the many opportunities God is giving us in home missions, world missions, and ministerial education. 2015 also saw the release of My Son, My Savior, the new Wells evangelism film that brings the gospel message to people around the world. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The number on the calendar may change, but the core work we do together as a synod, the work that you have shared in, does not change. God gives us the privilege to work together to bring the good news to people everywhere, in our schools, our churches, our missions, and any other opportunity God provides. We'll continue to be diligent in our planning and in our use of resources as we look ahead to the coming years. And as we do that, we know that another thing that will not change with the calendar is God's continuing grace and mercy in Christ. May God continue to bless you and your family in the coming year.